Okay, pardon the interruption. This is part two. Okay, I'll start from this paragraph. One thing that such scholarship reveals is that time proceeds in cycles rather than in linear fashion. According to the Puranas, I'll focus in on that. The basic unit of these time cycles is the day of Brahma, which lasts 4.3 billion years. The day of Brahma is followed by the night of Brahma. During the day of Brahma, life is manifest. During the night of Brahma, life is not manifest. If we consult the ancient Sanskrit calendar of cosmic time, we learn that we are about 2 billion years into the current day of Brahma. Now let's imagine that we have a Vedic archaeologist. Based on the information given above, he or she would expect to see signs that living things have been present on Earth for about 2 billion years. Interestingly enough, modern day science says that the oldest signs of life on Earth do indeed go back 2 or even 3 billion years. These signs of life include fossils of algae and other single-celled creatures. But our Vedic archaeologists would not be surprised to also find signs of more advanced life forms, including the human form. A conventional archaeologist, however, would not expect to find any such thing. According to conventional views, human beings like ourselves have appeared fairly recently on Earth within the last 100,000 years or so. Taking all this into consideration, our Vedic archaeologists would make two predictions. First, scientists digging into the earth should find signs of a human presence going back hundreds of millions of years. Second, this evidence will largely be ignored because it radically contradicts the ideas of human origins currently held by the scientific community. This leads us to the concept of what I call the knowledge filter. The knowledge filter represents the dominant ideas of the scientific community regarding human origins and antiquity. Evidence that conforms to these ideas passes easily through the filter. Evidence that varies slightly from these ideas may pass through the filter with some difficulty but evidence that radically contradicts these dominant ideas will not pass through the filter. Such evidence is forgotten, set aside, or in some cases, actively suppressed. The evidence, I mean, the existence of the knowledge filter is something that scientists themselves will admit. I was looking down here to see if but all this is already in these, so. All right. The existence of the knowledge filter is something that scientists themselves will admit. When archaeologist Will Robrex of the University of Leiden visited me in Amsterdam, we had a long talk about it, and he shared with me some of his own personal experiences with knowledge filtration in the treatment of evidence for the earliest occupation of Europe, particularly Northern Europe. Of course, it goes without saying that I think the filter operates differently and to a greater extent than he would accept. For example, Robrex thinks the filter operates to unfairly include evidence for a very early occupation, whereas I believe it operates to unfairly exclude it. Hmm, right, to exclude the evidence, not to include it. In Forbidden Archaeology, I document two things. Hundreds of cases of scientifically reported evidence for extreme human antiquity consist with the account of human origins given in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India. The process by which this evidence has been filtered out of normal scientific disclosure. That's what's documented in archaeology. Let's now look at some particular cases. 
In the last century, gold was discovered in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. And miners came from all over the world to extract it. At first, they simply, simply took the gold from streams. <coughs> Excuse me. But afterwards, they began to dig mines into the sides of mountains, inside the tunnels where they were digging into solid rock. The miners found human skeletons, spear points, and numerous stone tools. These finds occurred at many different locations. One of them was Table Mountain in Tulum County, California. According to modern geological reports, the rock in which the miners found the bones and artifacts at Table Mountain is about 50 million years old. Our Vedic and archaeologists, our Vedic archaeologists would not be surprised at this, but our conventional archaeologists would be very surprised because his textbooks say that no humans or even ape men existed at that time. Mm -hmm. The California discoveries were very carefully documented and reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, a geologist for the state of California. His work, The Auriferous Gravels of the Sierra Nevadas, was published by Harvard University in 1880. So why do we not hear anything about these discoveries today? I'm still going to read this. If I read it again, that's all right. In other words, if the facts do not agree with the favorite theory, then such facts, even an imposing array of them, must be discarded. Shade. Whitney's work was dismissed by Dr. William H. Holmes, a very influential anthropologist who worked at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. He said in the Smithsonian Institution's annual report for 1898 to 99, perhaps if Professor Whitney had fully uh, appreciated the story of human ev oh the story of human evolution as it is understood today he would have hesitated to announce the conclusions formulated that humans have existed in very ancient times in north america notwithstanding the imposing array of testimony with which he was confronted in other words, if the facts do not agree with the favorite theory, then such facts, even an imposing array of them, must be discarded. This is a good example of the operation of the knowledge filter. Mm. Wow. And the knowledge filtration process continues to influence the California gold mine discoveries even today. I appeared on a television show called The Mysterious or Origins of Man, produced by BC Video and broadcast by NBC, the largest television network in the United States. This show was based in part on my book, Forbidden Archaeology. The show also featured the work of other researchers who challenged the current ideas of human prehistory. Among them was Graham Hancock, author of Fingerprints of the Gods. Earlier this year, Graham and his wife, Santa, stopped to visit me in Los Angeles on their way to Japan, where they were going to investigate some underwater pyramids, apparently of human construction. In the course of our conversation, we agreed that a lot of the really exciting scientific research is going on outside of normal channels. Okay. In any case, when the producers were filming The Mysterious Origins of Man, I asked them to go to the Museum of Natural History at the University of California at Berkeley, where the California gold mine artifacts were stored. The producers asked the museum officials for permission to film the artifacts. The muse museum officials, assuming that the producers were working on a tight deadline, said they could not bring out the objects on such short notice. 
The producers then explained that they had six months' time to finish their work. The museum officials then said they had another problem, a shortage of staff and money. They would have to pay their workers overtime to bring out the objects and could not afford to do it. Oh, my goodness, really? The producers... The producers replied that they would pay the museum workers any amount of money required. But at that point, the museum officials simply said they were not going to bring out the artifacts for filming. Mm. Finally, the producers just used some 19th century photographs of the objects in the show. When the show finally aired in February 1996, it inspired extreme reactions from the Orthodox scientific community in the United States. This was the first time that a major American television network had ever broadcast a show that seriously questioned the Darwinian account of human origins. Why was the scientific community so angry? One reason is they did not like anti-Darwinism ideas reaching American school children through the popular medium of television. The president of the National Center of Science Education, as reported in the journal Science, complained that after the mysterious origins of man was broadcast, the phones in his organization's headquarters were ringing constantly. So, tell the truth. Science teachers from all over the country were calling, saying that their students who saw the show were asking them difficult questions. So good. Meanwhile, on the internet, scientists wondered what effect such television programs might eventually have on government funding for certain kinds of scientific research. Most of the opposition to the program came from what I call the fundamentalist Darwinian group within the scientific community. This group adheres to Darwinism more out of ideolo ideological commitment than scientific objectivity. If this group was disturbed when NBC showed the mysterious origins of man in February 1996, they became even more disturbed when they learned that NBC was going to show it again, despite their protests. After the show aired a second time, Dr. Allison R. Palmer, president of the Institute for Cambrian Studies, sent an email message dated June 17, 1996, to the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, of the United States government, asking the FCC to punish NBC for showing the program to the American people. This letter was circulated on scientific discussion groups by Dr. J.R. Lips, a paleontologist at the University of California at Berkeley, in order to generate more pressure from scientists on the FCC. Palmer and his supporters wanted the FCC to censor NBC for showing the program, compel NBC to repeatedly broadcast a public apology, wow, and compel NBC to pay a substantial Fine. Fortunately, this effort did not succeed. When all this shows is that science does not always operate according to high ideals. The way science works, we are normally told, is on the basis of free and open discussion of evidence and ideas. But in the case of the mysterious origins of man... We see elements of the scientific community restricting access to evidence and preventing open discussions of it. Yes, there is a fact there is in fact a knowledge filter. I have fully 
documented the reactions to the mysterious origins of man, along with other reactions to forbidden archaeology, in a book titled Forbidden Archaeology's Impact. Now let's consider a case from the more recent history of archaeology. In 1979, Mary Leakey found dozens of footprints at a place called Laetoli in the East African country of Tanzania. She said that the footprints were undistinguishable from those of modern human beings, but they were found in layers of solidified volcanic ash that are 3.7 million years old. According to standard views, humans capable of making such prints should not have existed that long ago. So how do scientists explain Laetoli footprints? They say that there must they say that there must have existed in East Africa 3.7 million years ago some kind of ape man who had feet just like ours and that is how the footprints were made. That is a very interesting proposal but unfortunately there is no physical evidence to support it. Scientists already have the skeletons of the ape men who existed 3.7 million years ago in East Africa. They are called Australopithecus. Hmm? And their foot structure was quite different from that of a modern human being. This question came up when I was speaking at the World Archaeological Congress in Cape Town, South Africa. Also speaking there was this scientist, Ron Clark. In 1998, Clark discovered a fairly complete skeleton of Australopithecus. Pathicus, at a place called Sturkfontein in South Africa. This discovery was widely publicized all over the world as the oldest human ancestor. It was 3.7 million years old, the same age as the Laetoli footprints. But there was a problem. Clark reconstructed the foot of his Sturkfontein Australopithecus, Australopithecus in an ape-like fashion, as he should have because the foot bones were quite ape-like. For example, the big toe is very long and moves out to the side, much like a human thumb, and the other toes are also quite long, about one and a half times longer than human toes. Altogether, the foot was not very human-like. So after Clark gave his talk, I raised my hand and asked the question, why is it that the foot structure of your Sturkfontein Australopithecus does not match the footprints found by Mary Leakey at Laetoli, which are the same age, 3.7 million years old, but which are just like those of modern humans? <coughs> Excuse me. You see, what the problem was for him, he was claiming to have the oldest human ancestor. But there is evidence from elsewhere in Africa that human beings like us were walking around at the exact same time. So how did he answer my question? He said that it was his Australopithecus. who made the Laetoli footprints, but he was walking with his big toes pressed close to the side of the foot and with his other toes curled under. I did not find that to be a very satisfactory explanation. Scientists who find things that should not be found sometimes suffer for it professionally. One such scientist is Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre, an American geologist whom I know personally. In the early 1970s, some American archaeologists discovered stone tools and weapons at a place called What's that? Huiatlaco in Mexico. 
They included arrowheads and spear points. According to archaeologists, such weapons are made and used only by humans like us, not by ape men. At Huiatlico, Huiatlico, The artifacts were found in the bottom layers of the trenches. Of course, the archaeologists wanted to know how old the objects were. So when archaeologists want to know how old something is, they call in some geologists because the geologists will be able to tell them. The layer of rock in which you found these objects is so and so thousand years old. Among the geologists who came to date the site was Virginia Steen McIntyre using four of the latest geological dating methods she and her colleagues from the united states geological survey determined that the artifact bearing layer was three hundred thousand years old when this information was presented to the chief archaeologist the chief archaeologist said that it was impossible according to standard views there were no human beings in existence three hundred thousand years ago anywhere in the world not to speak of North America. The current doctrine is that humans did not enter the Americans any earlier than 30,000 years ago. So what happened? The archaeologists refused to publish the date of 300,000 years. Instead, they published an age of 20,000 years for the site. And where did they get that date? It came from a carbon-14 date on a piece of shell found five kilometers from the place where the artifacts were found. Shenanigans. Steen McIntyre tried to spread the word about the true age of the site. Because of this, she began to get a bad reputation in her profession. She lost the teaching position she held at a university and all of her opportunities for advancement in the United States Geological Survey were blocked. Damn. She became so disgusted that she went to live in a small town in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado and remained silent for 10 years. Until I found out about her case and wrote about it in Forbidden Archaeology, giving her work some of the attention it deserves. Partly because of this, the Huyatlico site is now being studied by more open-minded archaeologists and hopefully before too long.